2022 Q&A webcast. My name is Martin Vieca, VP of Industry Relations, and I'm joined today by Elon Musk, Zachary Kirkhorn, and a number of other executives. Our Q1 results were announced at about 3 p.m. Central Time in the update deck we published at the same link as this webcast. During this call, we will discuss our business outlook and make forward-looking statements. These comments are based on our predictions and expectations as of today. Actual events and results could differ materially due to a number of risks and uncertainties, including those mentioned in our most recent filings with the SEC. <laughs> During the Q, uh, question and answer portion of today's call, please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. And please use the raise hand button to join the question queue. Before we jump into Q&A, uh, Zach will have some opening remarks. Zach? Yeah, thanks, Martin. Um, uh, just to start off here, Q1 was a challenging but extremely successful quarter for the company. Despite numerous supply interruptions, including shutdowns at our Shanghai factory and nearby suppliers due to COVID, we've continued making progress and achieved our best ever vehicle deliveries. Last quarter, we demonstrated a series of new financial records, including revenue, gross margins, operating margin, and bottom line profitability. Gap automotive gross margin reached 32.9%, and for the first time exceeded 30% when excluding regulatory credits. Higher pricing continues to positively impact our financials as we make progress delivering cars in our growing backlog. Note that for most vehicles, our delivery wait times are quite long, thus cars delivered in Q1 generally carried pricing set in prior quarters and at levels lower than cars being ordered today. Our per unit vehicle costs increased as well. Inflation, raw material prices, expedites, and logistics costs continues to impact our cost structure. Factory shutdowns also occurred with little to no notice, hence we are unable to take action to plan those interruptions in a cost efficient manner. Additionally, we saw a slight mix shift towards more profitable vehicles, including the Model Y. We also recognized a one-time benefit of 288 million from credit revenue relating to a regulatory change in the US CAFE penalty, without of which credit revenue would have declined compared to the same period last year. The energy business has continued to be impacted by macro conditions more severely than the vehicle business. Our storage products are in need of chip supply and new import processes have, impact, have impacted supply of certain components for our solar systems, which is reflected in our solar volume for the quarter. OPEX as a percentage of revenue continues to reduce, driven by higher revenue, lower stock-based comp expense and other items. As a result of our ongoing improvements in operating leverage, we achieved a record operating margin of over 19%. Note that commissioning costs for our factories are in R&D as Berlin started production in late March and Austin in early April. These costs will be in automotive cogs going forward given these factories are now producing customer sellable cars. Our free cash flows have remained quite strong, yet we're impacted by working capital related to lower than planned production. Additionally, we have reduced our debt, excluding product financing, to nearly zero. Looking ahead in the immediate term, a few things to keep in mind for Q2. First, we've lost about a month of build volume out of our factory in Shanghai due to COVID-related shutdowns. Production is resuming at limited levels and we're working to get back to full production as quickly as possible. This will impact total build and delivery volume in Q2. Second, as I've mentioned before, Austin and Berlin are just starting their ramps, and thus those inefficiencies will start to flow through our gross margins in Q2. Third, we do have higher ASPs in our backlog, which will help to offset some of these headwinds. We continue to drive towards further strengthening of our financials in the second half of the year, and believe our 50% or above growth rate remains achievable for the year. I want to conclude by thanking the Tesla team, our suppliers, and our new customers for a great first quarter. Thank you very much. And Elon has some opening remarks as well. Sure. Uh, some of my remarks will be um, redundant with Zach's, but it's maybe worth repeating. Uh, Q1 was once again a record quarter on, on many levels, I re reaching the highest deliveries, uh, profit, and, and an operating margin of 19%. This was despite a lot of chip shortages, many logistics challenges, um, and an overall difficult quarter. Um, so I'd really like to congratulate the, the Tesla team uh, on uh, achieving record profitability and, uh, and output uh, despite uh, many, many difficult headwinds. Um, and especially the 
Tesla, uh, China, uh, Tesla China team and uh, in, in our Shanghai factory, um, they they really had a, a significant challenges due, due to the COVID shutdowns, and nonetheless um, have been able to output a, a tremendous number of, of high quality vehicles, um, and we are already back up and running uh, with uh, uh, the, the Shanghai factory. Um, so, uh, as as Zach said, uh, we remain confident of a, a 50 percent growth in vehicle production uh, in 2022 versus 21. Um, I think we we actually have a reasonable shot at a 60 percent uh, increase uh, over uh, last year. So, um, let's see. Um, Obviously, we we it, we uh, yeah production as people know with uh, Giga Berlin and Giga Texas in the, uh, in the past few months. Uh, so we're two uh, fantastic factories with great teams, um, and they uh, are ramping rapidly. Uh, now with with new factories, the initial ramp always looks small, but it grows exponentially. So. Uh, but I, I, I have very high confidence in the teams of both factories, um, and we expect to uh, ramp, ramp those initially slowly, but but like I said, growing exponentially uh, with uh, them achieving high volume by the end of this year. So, um, let's see. Um, we're also working on a new vehicle that I alluded to at the Giga Texas opening. Uh, which is a, a dedicated robo taxi that's uh, highly optimized for uh, autonomy, uh, meaning it would not have steering wheel or pedals. Um, and th there are a number of other innovations around it that I think are quite exciting, um, but it's fundamentally uh, optimized for it's trying to achieve the the lowest uh, fully considered uh, cost per mile or cost per kilometer. Uh, you know, accounting everything, um, and and so it's I think going to be a very powerful product, uh, where we aspire to reach volume production of of that in 2024. So I think that 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 really will be a massive driver of Tesla's uh, growth, uh, and we remain on track to reach volume production of the Cybertruck uh, next year. Let's see. Um, so it's basically uh, once again, I'd like to, to thank uh, the, the Tesla employees for their hard work, but also I'd like to, to thank our suppliers uh, who have really gone the extra mile. Um, they they uh, we have an amazing supplier group, and um, I just want to say a heartfelt thanks to the suppliers that have that have really worked day and night to ensure that uh, Tesla is able to uh, keep the factories running. And we're really at, at, at uh, the early stage of our journey. We uh, only crossed uh, one million units in the in the past uh, twelve months uh, recently, and uh, we are we aspire to head to twenty million units a year. So we're basically five percent along the way to, uh, for towards our goal. And um, but we are growing, uh, you know, very very rapidly a year over year. Um, and uh, remain confident of exceeding 50% uh, annual growth uh, for the, the foreseeable future for basically several years, several of the next years. I mean, <coughs> so, yeah. Um, and then there's, of, of course, Optimus, which uh, I was surprised that people did not realize the the magnitude of the Optimus robot program. Uh, this, the, the importance of Optimus will become apparent in the coming years. Uh, those who are insightful or look, listen carefully uh, will understand that Optimus ultimately will be worth more than the car business, worth more than FSD. That's my firm belief. Um, so, and, and then of course, insurance is 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 growing well. Um, 
we expect to address the the part shortages that limited our progress with batteries and solar. So we expect batteries and solar to, to also grow well this year. And um, basically the future is very exciting. I've never been more uh, optimistic or excited about the future, Tesla's future than I am right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to first in investor question. And the first investor question is, Elon has historically provided FSD timelines with not optimal accuracy. We love if it's optimism for 2022 release, but is there any data Tesla can share with investors to help them make their own conclusions on progress being made, interventions per mile driven, or any other data? Sure. <clears throat> um, well, it, with respect to full self-driving, um, of any technology development I've ever been involved in, I've, I've never really seen more kind of false dawns or, or where it seems like we're going to breakthrough, but but we don't, as I've seen in uh, full self-driving. And ultimately, what it comes down to is that to solve full self-driving, you actually have to solve real-world artificial intelligence, uh, which is which nobody has solved. Um, the whole road system is made for um, biological neural nets and, uh, and eyes. And so, actually, when you think about it, in order to solve uh, uh, full self-driving, we have to solve uh, neural nets and, and cameras um, to a degree of fun a capability that is on par with and really exceeds humans. Um, and uh, I, I, I think we will achieve that this year. The best way to uh, reach your own assessment is to join the Tesla full self-driving beta program. We have over 100,000 people right now enrolled in, in that program, and we expect to broaden that significantly this year. So uh, that's that's my recommendation, is, is join the full self-driving beta program and experience it for yourself uh, and take note of the uh, rate of improvement with every release. And we, we put out a new release roughly every two weeks. Uh, so it... Uh, and you'll see a little bit of two steps forward, one step back, uh, but overall, uh, the rate of improvement is incredibly quick. So that's my recommendation for reaching your own assessment is, is literally try it. Thank you. Uh, the second question is, how much of an impact will the uh, production shutdown in Shanghai have in Q2? What is the timeline for localizing the Model 3 in Europe, or uh, will never new, or will newer models be prioritized in Berlin? Well, the um, yeah, we did lose a, a lot of important days of production, and and there's there are sort of upstream supplier challenges where a lot of suppliers also lost uh, many days of production, but uh, our Tesla Shanghai. Giga Shanghai is coming back with a vengeance. Uh, so I'm, I think, uh, notwithstanding, you know, new issues that arise, I think we will see record output per week um, from Giga Shanghai uh, this quarter. Um, albeit we are missing a couple of weeks. So, um, you know, that that means that most likely uh, vehicle production in Q2 will be similar to Q1, maybe slightly lower, uh, but it's also possible we may pull a rabbit out of the hat and, and be slightly higher, but it's be call it roughly on par. Um, but, uh, then, but then Q3 and Q4 will be substantially higher. Um, so it, it, you know, it, it seems likely that we'll be able to produce uh, over one and a half million cars this year. That's my, that, that's my best guess. Uh, and then Model 3, uh, it's important for new factories to be focused um, on uh, and have the least amount of uh, complexity and variation, which is why uh, Gigabull and Giga Texas are focused on the Model Y. Um, it, it's, it's from the point at which you have a factory complete and, you, and, and you're making a, a small number of units to the point where it's uh, uh, producing uh, high quality vehicles uh, in volume uh, is, uh, you know, 
sort of nine to 12 months from start of production. So now hopefully we're, we're, we're getting better at that ramp. So maybe it's a little less, but uh, to, to get to sort of the 5,000 a week uh, level is typically uh, taken us uh, around 12 months from start of production. Um, yeah. So. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, how much raw material exposure do you have measured roughly in percentage of uh, percentage of cost of goods sold, for example, in a given quarter versus one to two years out, both direct and indirect? Separately, how do you think about price increases versus prioritizing higher mixed vehicles going forward? Um, I, actually, on the, on the price increase front, I should mention that it may seem like like maybe we're being unreasonable about increasing the prices of our vehicles, given that we had record profitability this quarter. But the the, the, the wait list for our vehicles is quite long. And some of the vehicles that people will order, uh, the, the wait list extends into next year. So uh, our prices of vehicles ordered now are really anticipating uh, uh, supplier and logistics cost growth uh, that uh, that we're that we we're, we're aware of and believe will happen uh, over the next uh, you know, six to twelve months. So uh, that that's that's why we have the price increases today because a car order today would will, will arrive in some cases a year from now. So we have a very long wait list, um, and um, we're, we're obviously not. Uh, Demand limited. We are production limited by very much production limited. Uh, raw material exposure. Yeah, just to add to what Elon is saying, um, you know, there's there's different ways to calculate raw material exposure. Um, I, I think a simple way we estimate we're around 10 to 15 percent of our cost structure uh, exposed to raw materials. Um, and you know, just to clarify a couple of things on that. So we've we've been experiencing increases in costs in general, but also raw materials for a number of quarters now. Um, th that pace picked up in Q Q1, so last quarter, and what we're seeing uh, for Q2 uh, is slightly higher than that as well. And you know, as indices move, it doesn't impact us immediately or directly. In some cases, we have contracts with suppliers, but then as those contracts expire, we have to renegotiate them so that there can be a lag. In some cases, um, our contracts do directly reflect movement in commodity prices or raw material prices, but um, you know the timing in which that that uh, that Tesla pays for that has a lag associated with it as well, based on the contract. And so to Elon's point, what we're trying to do here, because it's, it's quite an unprecedented situation of raw material movement and all of these various lags and uncertainty around renegotiating contracts, is we're trying to anticipate where things will go and make sure that the pricing that we have put in place at the time that those raw material cost increases hit us, that they align and that the company can remain financially healthy in various scenarios as we look out over the next four quarters. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is, uh, why does Tesla continue to fight dealership laws on a state-by-state -state basis versus taking it federal? Separately, why isn't Tesla using a 800 volt architecture uh, in its vehicles? What are the advantages or disadvantages? <laughs> sure, well, uh, from Tesla's standpoint, obviously we'd love to have federal legislation that allows uh, direct sales in all states, um, but we have uh, not seen um, willingness on the part of uh, the Congress uh, to enact such laws that would override, uh, the, the override uh, state laws. So uh, unfortunately, we have to fight it on a state-by-state -state basis. Um, and uh, Drew, do you want to answer the 800 volt question? <laughs> yeah, sure, on the 800 volt thing. Um, yeah, so it's it's really a case-by-case -case thing for the smaller platform vehicles like 3 and Y. There's, you know, there's some wins and losses with 800 volts. Not everything is is better. Um, and so we look at that platform and, you know, we, we're not like ignoring the reality that you can go to a higher voltage, but it, it, there's no, no, nothing really encouraging us to do so on that platform. Uh, it's really about mass and power. And uh, as you look at bigger vehicles, there, there are some 
advantages uh, uh, on those bigger vehicles. Yeah, so, I want to just quantify that. that basically, yeah. basically like, <laughs> our estimate is that like, going for 400 to 800 volts might save 100 bucks. Yep. It's, it's not really moving the needle. And you're changing many things. Yes, but exactly. From the charging infrastructure all the way through the entire vehicle system. Yes. To get maybe $100. Yes, exactly. So, um, I mean, in the U.S., you've got a 110 volt uh, household like power or voltage, and and then in, in your most parts of the world, you have like sort of 220. Um, but really, it doesn't make that much of a difference. And appliances work pretty much as as well, you know, in say Europe as they do in the U.S. Yeah. Um, so, the, the, there's some the advantages are are, are small, um, and the, and the cost is high. Uh, like if say like long term, like years from now, is it does it make sense to probably move to an 800 volt architecture? I said probably, but it really needs a, a very big vehicle volume to pay for the, all the costs of uh, changing from 400 to 800 volts. Um, and then, and then the, uh, you, know, you want to continue with the. Oh, I was just going to say that 100 volts is also kind of like a spreadsheet exercise, right? 100 dollars. Like, sorry, 100 100 dollars is, is roughly like a spreadsheet exercise. Like you know that you have to get through the full. Program yeah. to the end to see that maybe it's been whittled away to 50 or, or less. Yeah. Um, uh, on on bigger vehicles where you're talking about higher power on the charging side or higher power from the battery to the power electronics, or you need more torque, so so the the, the current requirements go up. There's a little bit more semiconductor and and uh, actual like you know conductor savings of going to the higher voltage. Um, and and so we we do consider that for semi and cyber truck, but for the three-way platform where we've got everything running and the benefit is questionably small. Yeah, it's it's basically zero for robo taxi. Yeah, for robo taxi, yeah, it doesn't make yeah. sense. Yeah. Uh, so. No, 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 no. Sorry, sorry. No, this this uh, sorry. Uh, big one, big one, big one. Sounds good. <laughs> Okay, let's go to the next question. Um, next question is, uh, how are the current 4680s performing versus expectations set during the battery day in terms of expected range increase and dollars per kilowatt hour? Yeah. Yeah, um, we're, we're working in all the areas we shared um, uh, on uh, battery day, and we have sort of consistent progress across all of those areas towards achieving the five-year cost trajectory co uh, goals for the cost within our control, but we do not control uh, all of the commodity costs. So, you know, that that's that's an exception I need to call out. Um, similar to Model 3, it will take us several years to get rate and yield to the point where everything that we've discussed is, is achieved. Um, our priority was on simplicity and scale during our initial 4680 and structural battery ramps. And as we attain our manufacturing goals, we will layer in new material technologies we, we are developing and higher range structural pack revisions. Um, uh, I think maybe in a nutshell, sure. Uh, I think probably is fair to say that uh, 4680 uh, and structural pack will be competitive with the best alternatives uh, uh, later this year, um, and and we'll, we think will exceed the best alternatives next year. Yeah, I mean we have some good existing proofs, right? Like we've built the facility here in Texas. Like we know how much we spent on capital equipment in the facility. And it's you know more than five x less than prior uh, technology uh, installations. So we're saving huge on capex, uh, on utilities and and personnel. We we're, we we know what 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 those loads are and how many people are needed to run what is basically in a, a highly automated factory. And we have massive reductions in both of those. So like the cost model is is well understood. It's really about rate and yield, which will come in time, as Elon said, over the course of this year and next. Yeah. Thank you. And the next question is, how does Tesla plan to secure raw materials required to scale to extreme size? Yeah, so this is something we think about quite a lot. It depends what extreme size means, but, um, you know, so it's only like looking at, like, say, the like, uh, 5, 10, 20 million dollar, or 5, 10, 20 million vehicle um, levels. Uh, the, you, you really have to analyze the sort of macroeconomic uh, you know, just like, just think, like, what is the tonnage of uh, lithium that you need, of nickel, of iron phosphate, of uh, graphite, 
um, separators, electrolytes, uh, electrolyte, you know, it, it, it really needs to think of the, like just macro tonnage. Um, and we need to think about this for the world as a whole uh, because, you know, just uh, like with, we want to figure out what, what are limiting factors for accelerating the advent of, of a sustainable energy future. Um, and, and whatever those limiting factors are, Tesla will take action on those limiting factors. So right now we think um, um, mining and refining a lithium uh, is, uh, it appears to be a limiting factor. Um, and it certainly is, is uh, responsible for quite a bit of cost growth uh, in the cells. It's, I think, the single biggest cost growth item right now, uh, mm -hmm. certainly on a percentage basis. Um, although just for those who, who don't totally know this, uh, the actual content of lithium in a lithium ion cell is, is maybe around two or three percent of the cell. So yeah, five kg is a car. Yeah, it's it's not, <laughs> five kilograms exactly. It's it's not um, it's called a lithium ion cell, but by far the like the most expensive and he and heaviest item in the cell is the cathode. <laughs> um, so that's the the nickel or the uh, iron phosphate. So um we're looking carefully at all of the uh, raw materials um, and and trying to figure out how we can accelerate the, the total amount of raw materials needed to transition the world to sustainability um and i think we've got you know that we don't have enough time on this call to really go through all those details but we are thinking about these things and uh we think we'll have some exciting announcements in the months to come yeah one thing I, I want to call out is like we're also, you know, committed to recycling at all of our cell factories. Um, yeah. We're recycling 50 tons a week right now in Reno and ramping to 150 with all of that reclaimed material going directly back into our cathode supply chain. So we're looking at the beginning and end of life uh, uh, needs here. Yeah. And, and, and that's true. Like since Reno, we built Gigafactory, we started doing that with batteries. But as we built newer factories or vehicles, for example, Giga Texas here, where we are today, recycles all of its uh, non-yielded or scrap aluminum from the stamping shop directly into the casting shop. We regrind any plastic that yeah. goes out. And so we're really concerned about raw materials, not just like mining them and consuming them, but when we get them in the door, using all 100% of them. Yeah, Lars, that, that's a great point. Um, so we're storing, we're installing um, sort of uh, health bonuses for, um, for aluminum, like so for the, you know, for the Model Y that we build here uh, in at Giga Texas has both a front and a rear bo body casting. So we're, we're casting almost two thirds of the body, and then that's cast. It's high pressure die cast aluminum, um, and uh, so we can take both aluminum, both scrap from the casting machine, um, and the, the gating that comes out, and and put that back, just really toss that back into the melting aluminum melting pot and then as Lars was saying also take uh, any stampings um, and any other aluminum scrap um, and also throw that in the melting pot um, and, and in fact um, we, we've also uh, figured out that we can use um, wheels wheels from from practically any car um, wheels. yeah yeah so we're, we're going to be recycling um, the uh, aluminum cast aluminum wheels from um, legacy gasoline cars as well and, and and throwing that in the melting pot <laughs> uh, for our uh, uh, aluminum cast body of uh, model y and um you know and, and also we'll, we'll, we'll be moving to uh, the, the sort of cast front and rear body uh you know in in all vehicles over time well, well actually maybe not sx but three y <laughs> Thank you. Uh, at what rate do you expect Berlin and Austin to ramp relative to Shanghai? Are you able to leverage learnings from Shanghai or are the processes substantially different in the new factories? Ramp production uh, faster than Shanghai because we have learned a lot and we've now been through the, we have, we have basically veteran teams that have seen the three Y ramp, the Y ramp, especially um, in multiple locations. Um, and we're obviously share, sharing what we've learned. And so it, um, you know, we don't want to get complacent or entitled, but we, this should be a faster ramp because we have learned more 
and we've done a lot to simplify the production process of Model Y. Uh, that that should lead us to a faster ramp uh, with uh, in, in Texas and Berlin. Yeah. But we also had because it, structural and casting about thirty percent less robots. We expect to almost double the capacity for body, for example, reducing the so reducing the number of robots, but doubling our capacity in a lot of areas. Yeah, right. Uh, the, the the body line for in, for the structural pack is uh, and, and if you got structural pack and um, front and rear castings, uh, the body shop is. Uh, Body shop size drops by over 60% relative to um, the, st the standard way of making a, a car. And, and that tacks into general assembly and everything else because yeah. when we have the structural battery, the floor is the battery. We put the seats on the battery and then we put that in the car. So it's actually like between 10 and 15% less stations in GA because of the general assembly start. Yeah. Because as well. So really, really, it's like I think, I think about this in the way that we think about cars. If you're waiting for the best Tesla, you're going to be waiting forever. If you're waiting for our best factory, you're also going to be waiting forever because every new factory is better than the last one because we take all that learning so we throw it into it. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, next question is at Cyber Rodeo, Elon mentioned that a futuristic driverless robot taxi vehicle is on the roadmap. When can we expect more details on the product offering to be unveiled? Is this something that people can own or will this be only offered by Tesla as a service? Uh, so I think we want to hold off on, we, we don't want to jump the gun on an exciting product announcement too much. So I think we'll aim to uh, maybe do a product event for RoboTaxi next year and, and get into more detail. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we are uh, aiming for um, volume production in 2024. <clears throat> All right. Um, and maybe the last question from investors is, what is the current run rate of 4680 cell production at Fremont and at Giga Texas? What do you expect run rates of 4680 to be in Fremont at Giga Texas or Berlin at the end of the year? Uh, well, Berlin is, is using the uh, 2170 non-structural uh, pack. Uh, so they're, they're not constrained by 4680. Uh, they will transition to 4680 hopefully later this year. Uh, but current Berlin production does not requ require that. We also have, uh, just as a risk mitigation, uh, 2170 non-structural pack uh, capability at, in, um, at here at Giga Texas as well. Um, but uh, yeah, if things, if things go according to plan, we will be in volume production with 4680 uh, you know, and sometime perhaps in, towards the end of the third quarter and certainly in the fourth quarter. Is that which that's accurate? Yeah, and the other thing I would add is like with the China COVID shutdown and the semiconductor bottlenecks we had through Q4 and and a little bit in Q1, we have sizable cell inventory uh, at the moment and excess cells to support the 2022 volume targets you described. So that gives us <clears throat> the ability to be pretty deliberate in the 4680 ramp where we can maximize the learning step by step, take engineering downtime to upgrade key pieces of equipment and modify the structural pack design to improve reliability all while achieving what you just said. So, Yeah, if 4680 uh, output is, is not a risk to achieving one and a half million vehicles produced this year, um, but but it, it would become a risk next year if we do not solve yep. uh, volume production uh, it, you know, by early 2023, but we're highly confident of doing so. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to analyst questions now. Uh, the first question comes from Dan Levi from CSFB. Uh, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, uh, good good evening. Thank you for taking the questions. The questions first. Um, maybe you can just talk through or address what some of the drivers of cost improvement were in 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 the quarter. Um, was it just uh, further improvements within uh, Shanghai or in Fremont? Um, you know, anything around sort of ongoing Kaizen that you've talked about in the past? Maybe you could just talk through uh, what you benefited from in the first quarter. Sure. I mean, at, at a high level, uh, cars produced in Shanghai do carry a lower cost structure than cars produced in Fremont. And so as our, our mix of cars shift towards Shanghai, the average cost is positively impacted by that. 
Um, we're also seeing some progress in manufacturing efficiencies in Fremont, particularly on the SNX side, as volume increases improves there. Um, Expedites has been a huge story for the company. Q4, uh, we had massive amounts of Expedites. Q1 was still quite large, but we did make progress um, bringing that down some. Um, uh, it, it, yeah, to mention, like, uh, yeah, kudos, kudos to the Fremont manufacturing team and, and our associates there, because uh, we're achieving record output uh, at, at Fremont. Yeah. yeah, the Fremont team is doing a tremendous job. Really, really absolutely the yeah. back quarters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it's hard to under underweight. Like you should, the expedite situation with the crazy logistics that occurred with COVID. I mean, the, yeah, and, and you know, to Elon's point, you know, the, the Fremont team and also the Shanghai team has been extremely dynamic with the unpredictable nature of our part arrivals, and our supply chain team, in particular, production planning portion of supply team, supply chain. Uh, we, we often get very little notice when there's part shortages coming, and it's kind of a scramble couple days before that part is supposed to arrive to figure out how to get it here. And so the amount of Herculean effort that goes in to produce a quarter like Q1 and even the quarters before that is, is absolutely immense. Um, and right. so I mean, it's like the saying in the military, you know, it's like uh, amateurs talk about tactics, uh, professionals talk about logistics when it comes to war. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, so th there were some inherent cost improvements, as I mentioned, but, you know, there's also offsets that we've talked about previously on raw materials, commodities, uh, outbound logistics continues to remain a challenge, um, despite a ton of efforts to increase capacity there and bring those costs down. Great. Uh, Dan, do you then, have a follow-up? Sorry, go yeah, ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, this second question, you know, one of the initial goals of Model 3 way back when was to have an EV that was affordable for a, a wide portion of the market. And, you know, we know prices are, are much higher now, just given the supply constraints. Uh, prices are, are higher for, for all other automakers. We know that there's inflation that you're battling through, and some of that needs to be passed through to the to price of the vehicles. Um, and you're going to be supply constrained for the foreseeable future. So it's sort of a moot point. But given the, the goal long term of making EVs more widely available, uh, to the masses over time. How how do you look at uh, the progression of prices over time? We absolutely want to make um, EVs as affordable as possible. It's been very difficult with the, um, you know, I, I mean, I think inflation is at like a 40 or 50 year high. Um, and I think the, the the official numbers actually understate the true magnitude of inflation. So, um, and and that inflation appears to be uh, likely to continue for at least the remainder of this year. Is is what it, you know when we when we're talking to suppliers, the suppliers are under under severe uh, cost pressure. So um, yeah, you know, and it, in some cases we're seeing suppliers request 20, 30, 20 to thirty percent uh, cost increases for parts from. Um, last year to the end of the you know to the end of this year so it's there's there's a lot of cost pressure there um that's that's why we raised our prices because we in it and when things are this uncertain with, with respect to inflation if you know it's high then we and we're we've got orders that go out a year or more in some cases then we have to anticipate those those cost increases um but uh I think especially with the robotaxi and autonomy, I think we'll end up uh, providing uh, consumers with by far the lowest cost per mile of transport that they've ever experienced. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, with the robotaxi, like maybe five to ten times lower cost per mile, it's really quite substantial. And therefore, accessible to everybody. Yeah. I mean, it, looking at some of our projections, it, it, it would appear that uh, a robo taxi ride will cost less than a bus ticket, a subsidized bus ticket, or, or subsidized 
subway ticket. Thank you very much. Let's go to the next question from Rod Latch from Wolf Research. Hi, everybody. Um, I, I'm trying to just parse out your comments about the um, inflation and constrained supply and battery feedstocks and, and the initiatives that you are working on internally to secure these materials. It, it sounds like um, you're optimistic about Tesla's ability to solve this for Tesla. Uh, do you, but do you see this as, as a constraint on EV adoption more broadly? Yeah, absolutely. The, um, you know, what, what's sort of keeping um, our costs down, at least in the short term, is that we have long-term contracts with suppliers, but th those long-term contracts will obviously run out and, and then uh, you know, we'll start to see potentially significant cost increases. Um, but but the at a macro sort of looking at the world as a whole and saying uh, okay what does it take for Earth to transition to sustainable energy faster? It's it's fundamentally uh, the fundamental limiting factor is the output uh, of the cell the basically cell output. What, how, how, um, at what rate can lithium-ion cells increase the gigawatt hours per year? That is the fundamental limiting factor. Um, so, it, in order, for, and, and that will move as fast as the slowest, least lucky element of the whole supply chain. Um, currently, we see that uh, as being a, a challenge uh, with lithium. Um, and, and it's not that, to be clear, it's not that there's a, a shortage of lithium ore in the world. Uh, lithium is present almost everywhere, um, it's a very common element. Uh, however, you you still need to to you know to dig up the uh, ore, to dig up basically the sludge mean or whatever the the, the clay uh, with the lithium, uh, and and then you need to go through a whole series of re refinement steps, and that's a lot of industrial equipment that's needed uh, to go to refine uh, lithium ore to lithium that can be used as lithium hydroxide or lithium carbonate in um, the battery cell. Um, so we, we think we're going to need to help uh, the industry on this front. Um, um, but the, I mean, the industry is uh, going fast. And I'd certainly you know, encourage uh, entrepreneurs out there who are looking for opportunities to get into the lithium business. Uh, right, the lithium um, margins right now are practically software margins. <laughs> uh, I mean, if the, if the uh, I think of, it's something literally I think it is there's, there's a uh, I mean does that correct me if I'm wrong but I think um, we're, we're seeing cases where the, the the spot lithium price is uh, 10 times higher than the cost of extraction uh, so not like we're talking 90 percent margins here <laughs> can some can more people please get into the lithium business it's <laughs> if, if, if do you do you like minting money uh, well the lithium, lithium business is for you um. <laughs> so it, it, it interesting. So I guess we'll we'll stay tuned to see what 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 happens from that. Um, my, my second question is: um, it, it's impressive to see just a modest increase in costs per vehicle, cost of goods sold per vehicle, given what we've seen in terms of commodities, actually. And from here, you have a lot of savings uh, opportunities with forty six eighty cells and. The cell manufacturing changes, the anode chemistry, structural packs, giga castings. Um, are you suggesting that even those may not be sufficient to offset the inflation that you're seeing, and, and that you, you're going to need uh, additional pricing as well, in addition to those uh, specific initiatives that you've uh, called out? Well, we, we hope we don't need to increase the pricing further. Um, the current pricing is anticipating uh, what. We think is the probable growth in in costs, um, and if if those growths if, if that growth in cost does not materialize, we actually may slightly reduce uh, prices. So, um, so we don't currently anticipate making um, you know significant price increases. Um, but but obviously we don't we don't control the macroeconomic environment. <laughs> if governments 
keep printing vast amounts of money. Um, and, um, you know, and, and, and if, if there's not, if there are not uh, significant increases in uh, lithium uh, extraction and refinement and, and the other raw materials such that everyone's competing for a, a limited amount of raw materials, then obviously the, that will drive prices uh, to, to high levels. Um, so if, it's, if, if, you, if, you, if you have a crystal ball that can tell us what the future is going to be like, we'll adjust accordingly. But the current prices are what, what we the, the current prices are for a vehicle delivered in the future, like six to twelve months from now. So this is our best guess. But, um, but I think if you zoom out, right, like as you said, our mission is to accelerate the transition to sustainable energy. So yeah. like we are working with our existing suppliers and others to figure out how to grow all of these raw materials as quickly as possible to not slow down the transition. Yeah. And, you know, whether that means we have to get directly involved in some cases or not comes down to the counterparty and their willingness to expand at the rate we think they should be able to expand. And that that's similar to what we've done with everything else. Like we built a gigafactory in Reno because it needed to be done. Yeah. And so, like, we will do what needs to be done to not slow down the transition. And affordability is a goal because yeah. it's unaffordable. It, it's going to retard the growth of, of what is inherently a good thing. So we, we can't have that as an outcome. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Pierre Ferragu from New Street Research. Thanks. Can you hear, can you hear me well? Yes. Yeah. Great. Um, I'd like to ask you some questions about um, free cash flow. Um, do you, um, so, so first, maybe in the long run, you learn, if, if you look at your performance and your gross, uh, your gross model and your gross ambitions, I did the math very quick and I see you guys sitting on four or maybe $500 billion of cash at the end of the decade. And, and I was wondering <laughs> if it's something uh, you have given some thoughts about. Well, uh, what, yeah, but that, 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 that might be like, uh, uh, you know, if, it, if, it, if inflation keeps going crazy, $500 billion might be like, you know, $20 billion today. I don't know. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll see what $500 billion buys you, in, you know, in a decade, uh, but it might be a lot less. Um, so I, I don't know if we'll, <laughs> that, that seems like a lot of, Cash. Uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll try to do something useful with it. Uh, I mean, Jack, you're, I don't know. It's a real high class problem, that's for sure. The way we've been, I think we have to take this one step at a time. And so, you know, we have in, investments that are happening right now <clears throat> to get Austin and Berlin up and running. And then, as Elon mentioned, installing capacity for uh, robo taxi production. Um, and, you know, there's some decisions that, as Elon alluded to, just, you know, to share in the future about what the economic model looks like. What the economic model looks like for robo-taxi. And so, you know, the way Elon and I have discussed this is... Sorry. Uh, uh, let's just... Let me just... Uh, yeah, everyone just mute if you're... Yeah, yeah so, so our focus is, you know, to get to the point where robo-taxis are on the road, uh, Optimus is in use, get the economic model for that dialed in, um, and then evaluate, you know, the size of cash flows at that point and make decisions then as to as to what's next. Okay, Pierre, do you have a follow-up question? Yes, 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 yes. I think, I think it, it, it. Okay. Let's move on. All right. Uh, Let's go to the next one. Um, the next question comes from Trip Chaldry uh, from Global Equity Research. Thank you. Uh, two questions I have. Uh, first is regarding the Cybertruck. And I was wondering, like, uh, in terms of number of parts, uh, how would Cybertruck compare with a traditional pickup truck in terms of number of parts? The second question I have is on Gigafactory Nevada Sparks. Will we have any production of vehicles in that factory, or all the future production will happen in Giga Austin? Thank you. 
Um, I'm not sure if we've actually done a comparison of uh, Cybertruck parts versus regular truck parts. I mean, Lars? Uh, yeah, I mean, like if, if you want to go down to like, depends on what you kind of part. Like, we still have cells and they're, you know, still balls and cells. But, like, if we yeah, can, that shouldn't count. If we don't count that, like so the simplicity of our structure is, is, is significant versus a, a, a traditional, um, you know, pickup truck or any other vehicle. Like, you know, as we've talked about their giga castings, we save hundreds of, of yeah. band parts there. I mean, the entire rear kind of half of the car is a, one, is one, one casting. And even uh, still with the Cybertruck and the doors, for example, we have an exoskeleton design where the door is ready to take, and it takes all the, 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 you know, the side load from impact. So we really have, like, we don't have the door reinforcements. We don't have the yeah. crash and crew intrusion beams. So like, to your point, I haven't counted them because I don't often look back at, uh, at old technologies to decide how well I'm doing. I check that once in a while, but uh, in general, our architecture is always moving to reduce complexity, reduce parts, and reduce parts count. I would say, ignoring the battery cells, we were probably you know twenty to thirty percent less. All right. Um, okay. Uh, thank you. Let's go to the next. Nevada. Oh, Nevada. Oh, 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 do we expect to expand? Yeah, we do. We, we do expect to expand Gig Nevada. Um, this, there's a lot of room for for expansion there, and and we do expect to uh, uh, increase uh, output from from Nevada. Um, uh, but but the, the 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 by far the, the biggest increase in output will be from Giga Texas. Thank you very much. The next question comes from Alex Potter uh, from Piper Sandler. Alex, can you hear us? Yes. Hi, Martin. Can you hear me? Yep. OK, great. Um, so first question I had was the extent to which uh, other plants outside of China are insulated from any further upstream supply bottlenecks that we may have in China. Obviously, if this COVID lockdown thing gets out of hand, clearly that's going to continue impacting Shanghai. But is there a point at which it could actually also impact other facilities? Yeah, if it were to continue, uh, but uh, th there there are some parts that are sourced in China that apply worldwide, um, and that would be that would impact uh, production elsewhere. But um, all indications are that uh, uh, you know we 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 are we're out Giga Shanghai is back in production um, at fairly high levels already, and and uh, so are our suppliers. Uh, so. We don't think this is going to be a big deal. OK, thanks. Uh, second question. Um, obviously, the, the higher profitability that you guys have been able to experience over the last couple of quarters, a lot of that is reflecting sort of quote unquote real improvements. Uh, another part of it is because we're no longer paying you, Elon, as much as we were. And so I'm wondering, you know, the extent to which you and the board are in the process of contemplating another one of these long-term compensation packages, which in the past have seemed to work out quite well. Thanks. Um, there are no no discussions currently underway for incremental compensation for me. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Colin Langham from Wells Fargo. Oh, great. Do you, do you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Uh, just to follow up, sorry to keep going on the, the raw material issue on the battery side, but obviously seems pretty important. Yeah, how quickly can raw material supply be built? Because my understanding, it takes many years to build that out. So are we just sort of facing, when do you think we see a lithium shortage or a nickel shortage? And is there even enough time to build that sort of mining capacity in place? And then related, you know, how quickly can you switch to like LFP, you know, for, for the nickel issue? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll take the LFP question. Like, you know, and it says so in our letter, but like half of our products were LFP last quarter, which shows how quickly we were able to uh, respond to, well, honestly, it, it wasn't because of a raw material shortage, but just because it seemed like the right thing to do, we could change our cathode chemistry. Um, and and there's more to be done on the, on the, on the cathode side, and we are actively pursuing it to, to give us substitution flexibility in response to market conditions between um, the the other cathode uh, cathodes that are out there that can be competitive in our vehicles of which there are, are many options so you know we, we, we um, I guess what I would say is uh, specifically on the cathode side 
like flexibility is the is the way we're going to achieve this. And not all of the materials that go into cathodes are actually, first of all, hard to secure, like through mining or refining. Um, and, and, and second of all, uh, in, in many cases are like very plentiful already, like huge scale. And, you know, if all of the batteries in the world use those cathodes, it's less than a 1% increase in total uh, annual output. So that's that's the that's the cathode side. You know, I think Elon already spent a lot of time talking about lithium. Um, it really depends on the resource. Some resources like just getting rocks out of the ground you know, expanding the amount of rocks that you're getting out of the ground is, you know, maybe a little bit of paperwork and some additional um, sort of blasting and and, and trucking uh, operations. The refining is 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 maybe where there's, you know, it's a little bit more chunky to to bring it online. But also, the refining doesn't. It's not like an oil refinery. It's a much much smaller operation to refine uh, lithium out of spodumene or or or, or liquid. Um, uh, like a brine or or a salt salt pond evaporation, so you know you're talking about a time scale of one to two years, and it's not like we haven't been talking uh, to all of the lithium you know many, uh, suppliers out there for many years. They have a lot of projects already in the pipeline to come online this year and next. Uh, some of what's going on in the lithium market this year doesn't actually pr- have truth to bear to the like fundamentals of supply and demand. Um, which is also a little frustrating, um, but uh, but but yeah, if we look past this year or next year and into 2030 when we need 15 to 20 terawatt hours of this stuff to you know get on the growth trajectory, stay on the growth trajectory we're on, um, we need we need everybody to do more in the lithium space than they currently are. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So let's go to the last question from Mark Delaney from Goldman Sachs. Uh, Yes, uh, good afternoon and thank you very much for taking the question. I was hoping you could comment on your latest thoughts about potentially opening up the charging network in the U.S. to non-Tesla owners. Um, It's certainly really important to have a good experience for Tesla owners in terms of wait times or charging stalls, but if if Tesla is able to have enough capacity, you know, it could be a really good way to bring other vehicle owners into the Tesla network, uh, perhaps help Tesla to sustain its network benefits and, and maybe make more people likely to buy Tesla vehicles in the future. Yeah, as as Elon has said, and as we've publicly committed, yeah, we we do plan to to uh, provide third party vehicle access in all over the world, not just in Europe, where our original pilot was. And we are um, working on solutions in North America, which is a little bit more problematic with our uh, connector being different than others. Um, uh, but we are, you know, we are moving in that direction. I don't know if you want to add. Yeah, yeah, I think that's there's like more to be said on that part. We're, um, yeah, we want to do the right thing with respect to the whole the whole system. Mm-hmm. And we're going faster on adding chargers. Absolutely, right? with the growth of the cars that we're producing, and then anticipating what Drew is discussing, overall charger capacity is really important. And so the the pace of our investments in supercharging has accelerated. Absolutely. Okay, that's helpful. And um, for my second question, could you share any more details on Tesla insurance in particular as you're rolling it out in more states? uh, Are there any metrics you can share on what take rates have been like and how do uh, profitability margins on the insurance offering compare to the corporate average? Thank you. Um, So we just launched Tesla insurance um, for real-time insurance in Virginia, Colorado, and Oregon earlier this week. Um, maybe one step that I'll share. So Texas is our longest standing real-time insurance market. But based upon the information that we have, you know, Tesla is the second largest insurer of Teslas in the state of Texas. And um, possibly by the end of this quarter, maybe early next quarter, will be the largest insurer uh, of Teslas. And so, you know, the customer reception to this has been quite positive. And um, uh, if I was reading social media on Monday after we launched in the three new states. Um, A lot of folks were reporting their stories of saving quite substantial amounts of money relative to their previous insurance. And so we're quite encouraged by that. And we're working as quickly as we can to get to 80% of customers having access to a Tesla insurance product by the end of this year. Uh, In the United States, 
you know, at which point we'll pivot our attention to expansion outside of the U.S. Um, the other thing I'll say on insurance is with these three new states, um, the, the model is different because we are now the underwriter and we are also now holding the risk. And so uh, with those states, we are a fully vertically integrated provider of insurance um, from systems and financials. Uh, with, with respect to the financials of the program, it's still very early. And so you know, as the program gets more scale, uh, happy to share more information on that. And one, one side note is that we are seeing that the that having real time uh, feedback for uh, driving habits uh, is actually um, resulting in Tesla owners uh, driving the cars uh, in a safer way. Um, so, you know, because they can see the they get real time feedback on okay, this is this is affecting my insurance rate uh, or it isn't, um, and and so when people see it, can, can see it or see, see a real time score. Um, and realize, oh, if I if I make the polling changes in my um, driving habits, then I pay less in insurance. Then they have a, you know a, a very like a, a real time feedback loop for uh, driving for safer driving and an incentive to do so. So it is actually what we're seeing is it is causing people to drive uh, their cars in a safer manner, uh, which is also not good. It's safer on average, what we see in the data to Elon's point and uh, premiums are lower. Uh, we see that in the take rate data. We have extremely high retention uh, for customers who experience the product. And, and I think I've talked about this in the past, but this has become a real passion program for us, yeah. you know, for these benefits. It's, it's bigger than just the economics. We're trying to do a good thing here um, for our customers, save, save people money and make the roads a little bit safer. Yeah, I think it improves just overall macroeconomic efficiency. Um, it's also a feedback loop for for Tesla uh, because we see uh, if if there is um, you know a crash, um, if large or small, like uh, we we ne we sort of see exactly what that cost, and 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 now we okay think about how can we change the design of the car or the software uh, in order to minimize the probability of that. Uh, you know, accident. These because most accidents are minor, um, but how do we have those accidents occur less frequently, and uh, and how do we make the repair associated with that accident that accident uh, super fast? Like aspirationally, it'd be like same day repair from for a collision. You know, which is just night and day difference compared to sometimes having to wait for a month while insurance claims are settled and figured out and. Because because te Tesla is also doing collision repair. Um, but yeah, the feedback loop is instant. Yeah. Right. So I mean, we do claims management in house, and so we receive the notification that there's an accident. We work to prepare the estimate, and um, and we can you know with the support of our customers use our collision centers to do the repair. Yeah. And so it's you know full end to end visibility and all of that. To Elon's point, we can then identify areas of cost inefficiency feed those back to engineering teams or elsewhere, software teams, actually improve the product, yeah. which lowers the cost of insurance, improves reliability of the product. So it's a full full circle. Yeah, and it's I mean, they, they, basically the customer experience uh, is just vastly better um, because if, if there's an accident, it, it, there's no argument, it's, it's, we repair it immediately. Um, and this is as compared to arguing with an insurance company and then a claims adjuster and then a collision repair center. And uh, this, is, this can be a nightmare, basically. So we want to try to turn a nightmare into a dream with Tesla insurance. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have uh, this quarter. Uh, so thank you very much for all your great questions. And we'll speak to you again in three months. All right, hey everybody. Let me know if you can hear me. Sometimes there have been small audio issues here, but I just wanna do a quick recap of that call, some of the big things that we heard. So I'm just gonna keep an eye on the chat here until it kind of catches up and then we can do a quick recap. I am feeling very good about uh, what Tesla is doing here. It's, it's really exciting. This is a very exciting quarter. 
I think there's a lot to be happy about with the financial results, which if you didn't see my reaction to that, there is a link to that in the description. You can go check that out. Uh, looks like the audio is good. That's great. Uh, so yeah, I mean, this like financials are great. Uh, what Tesla is talking about doing here um, in terms of just their product roadmap, the, the plan for the next decade plus, uh, it's so difficult to not be extremely excited about that. Obviously, there's a lot of execution that remains, but we have seen Tesla do an amazing job of executing on their targets so far. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's very exciting. I think just from a recency bias perspective, talk about Tesla insurance here. Like that's just such a good example of of what Tesla does. They find things that are inefficient, and then they just, you know, <laughs> somehow, despite all the things that Tesla has to juggle all the time, they do a really great job of. Uh, you know, tackling those things and, and finding improvements and uh, just thinking from, again, Elon always talks about it, thinking from a first principles perspective to solve problems and make the world better. And it's just, it's awesome to see. So uh, exciting about that. Um, I think the biggest thing from the call here is just since we already went through the financials, I think obviously Tesla's making great improvements on on cost. Um, so it's exciting. Just fundamentally, they're starting to leverage. I mean, they've been doing that for the last two years now, but um we, what we've been talking about, about this leverage coming through, we're really starting to see that uh, $5 billion in EBITDA this quarter. Uh, Tesla, no debt they talked about. <laughs> uh, Pierre's question about the four or $500 billion on the balance sheet um, at the end of the decade. And Elon kind of laughs and says like, oh, who knows how much that's going to be worth. But, you know, I, I would imagine that Tesla's projections are actually a little bit higher than that. But I think Zach is makes a great point like take it one step at a time that's how tesla's approaching things and uh when when they get to that point where the robot taxis on the road printing money where optimus is out there hopefully printing money as well uh you know elon always says that once you have you know you only you only pay a dividend i don't think he said explicitly stock uh buy, stock buybacks but he says once you pay a dividend it's because you're out of ways to spend money uh you can kind of feel elon's tone on that shifting a little bit or his commentary around that um and i think that's based on on what tesla thinks is going to happen here so uh point being that i do think once those things are in place and once tesla you know at a certain point you just can't spend that money quickly enough and that's i look forward to those questions well i don't but i'm sure in some future year we're going to see questions about what tesla needs to do with its massive cash balance and investors really harping to get that returned and i do think at some point that's going to happen and you know tesla will be able to continue investing in the future and also you know just print print money for investors too so it's an exciting future from a product perspective it's an exciting future from a financial perspective um and again tesla just needs to needs to execute that on that the the roadmap is is quite clear all right so let's just look through some of the notes here um i'm going to kind of just like go back to the top here uh, and thanks for the super chats by the way i definitely appreciate those Hopefully the, the notes here are helpful. Um, all right, so I think from the opening comments, a lot of that stuff we've, we've kind of gone through. Uh, the revenue, the regulatory credit, this was something I considered in my forecast. I probably should have just put it in there, but um, we had talked about this a couple times on the podcast that there had been the change in the, basically the law from like 2017 to 2021 um, that had been reversed and caused extra, you know, more strictness in terms of the fleet-wide efficiency metrics for automakers in the U.S. and probably should have anticipated that, that would cause some extra regulatory credit revenue for Tesla. So that makes sense. Um, we can factor that out later on. OpEx, it's all great. No debt. Um, lost about a month out of Shanghai. So Elon said something here that was was very surprising. We'll have to kind of dig into the spreadsheets to uh, figure this out. But let's find Elon's comments here. Uh, he said that they're still going to be able to, maybe I didn't quite get it in the notes, but he said for Shanghai that even though they've been down for almost the entire month of April now, they, uh, oh, I guess, you know, two thirds of the month, they still think that for the quarter, they can hit similar levels of production as Q1 here. So that would be great. Um, we'll have to put that into our production tracking spreadsheet and just see what that means from a weekly production standpoint um but that suggests that there's going to be significant progress uh tesla should be making production line upgrades in may 
and hopefully that will result in really good production for June uh, and then further upgrades in July is uh, the current information. So um, those things are really going to improve the production rate and sounds like that's going to make up for some of the lost volume here in April, uh, which is, is really exciting because we can see that at this level, Tesla's financials are, are very strong. They did mention that uh, Berlin and Texas, although it didn't have a huge impact this quarter, Zach did specifically say that probably for next quarter that is going to uh, you know, cause a, a hit to gross margin. That doesn't necessarily mean gross margin would be down, but he seemed to emphasize that more of that would be coming next quarter. And I think a lot of that would be the start of 4680s uh, hitting cogs as well. All right, so this is the one thing that I bolded. Uh, I don't usually bold stuff, but I just felt like I had to here because... Elon talking about the dedicated robo taxi. He mentioned this on the master plan, and that was just sort of the first inclination that Tesla would be shifting from, you know, driving down on the on the cost curve for a consumer model, twenty five thousand dollar vehicle, whatever, uh, to just going straight to this robo taxi type of a situation. And now Elon giving us a timeline on that, saying perhaps unveiling that next year, and aspire to reach volume production of that in twenty twenty four. And uh, it's already 2022. <laughs> We're already in Q2 of 2022. So that's two years, um, maybe two years and six months. Uh, but that's, that's very soon. I mean, the Cybertruck was unveiled less time ago or more time ago than that would be from now. It's been two and a half years since, since the Cybertruck unveiling. So, uh, I guess it would be about the same. So we're, we're pretty close. I mean, the Cybertruck unveiling doesn't to me, it doesn't feel that long ago. Obviously, the delays make it feel a little bit longer, but um, yeah, we're, we're pretty close. The one thing I want to add on this is that this does become then a risk for if you don't if you don't think Tesla can solve FSD, like if you don't think they're going to actually be able to do level four type of driving in that time frame, it presents risk to Tesla's roadmap until that is solved. And I think from an institutional investor perspective. A lot of institutional investors would probably prefer that Tesla talked about having plans for um, vehicles beyond the Model 3 and the Model Y that are consumer meant for purchase by consumers. I think one of the analysts even asked, you know, can people buy that? I don't think they got a clear answer on that. Um, but this over the next two, three years, this is going to be a super hot topic of debate and cause of conflict between Tesla and Wall Street. Uh, until Wall Street starts to believe that, oh, FSD is actually solved or very close to being solved or solvable. Uh, we're, we definitely, we're not at that point yet where Wall Street believes that. Uh, and I think, you know, that that's totally fair. So the, what what's, what's already kind of happening, and you can hear it from the analysts on these calls, is they're trying to figure out how to build their models for 2024, 2025 and beyond. And when you've got a $25,000 Tesla on the roadmap, you can very easily build a model for that because you can just look at what Tesla's done with the Model 3 and the Model Y. You can make some cost assumptions and like just plug that in your spreadsheet and all of it looks great. When that product suddenly falls off and then you replace it with this dedicated robo taxi, which these analysts aren't going to model earnings for because they can't back it up because Tesla hasn't solved this problem yet that creates a whole giant set of question marks in where Tesla is heading. So uh, it, it's going to cause some, I don't know, if like tension, conflict, like whatever. It's, we're just going to keep getting questions about what, what this looks like until it's solved because it creates a lot of risk for Tesla to go directly to a robo-taxi from, from where they're at. Now, personally, I think Tesla would mitigate that risk just with Model 3 and Model Y. Like, I don't think analysts are really understanding how high Tesla's going to go the volume for those vehicles and they can drive the prices down uh, accordingly. So I think that's where Tesla's mitigating that. Um, but even still on those vehicles, there's probably some ceiling and that ceiling is probably below 20 million. So it's becomes a big question mark of how you get to 20 million if robo taxis don't happen. So probably being a little bit wordy on that topic, but hopefully that, that kind of makes sense. It's just going to be a a constant sort of battle with Elon saying, oh, we're doing robo taxis, Wall Street saying, you know, how are you going to keep growing volume at 50% if, if you don't solve this? Okay, so still aspire to head to 20 millions per year, uh, basically 5% the way there. But I would say they're, you know, probably closer to a 2 million production rate now than 1 million um, when they actually have production fully up and running. Uh, 
So, you know, call it 10%. Optimus, Elon, again, just reiterating, people don't get it. Uh, same thing there. Like, people get the impact that this would have. They just don't believe that Tesla is going to be able to pull this off. So, you know, same thing on that in terms of the the push and pull with Wall Street. But I think, you know, it's, it's very easy to understand the impact that that would have and, and the financial uh, benefit that that could have as well. Uh, insurance growing well, FC timelines. Uh, I wish they would have shared something on, you know, interventions per mile or something like that. Elon basically just saying, use the beta. Uh, I've been on the beta for, I don't know, six, six to seven to eight months. It, we've talked about this before, right? It's really, I think on an individual basis, it is difficult to assess progress. I definitely think things have improved, which is exciting. And we've talked before about how there are probably very much there are probably a lot of underlying factors that are improving that we just can't quite see that Elon has visibility to and an understanding of, and that shapes his experience and his context when he is experiencing FSD beta. Uh, even if he has, uh, even if he's on the same exact version that consumers are on, which most of the time he's not, he's usually using the, you know, the alpha version. So, um, it's like we have to consider that when we consider his comments too, on even experience, like even having the, ex the same experience. So I guess, uh, yeah, For, from my perspective, like I'm, I'm relatively neutral on FSD beta progress. Like it has progressed, but I, coming into the beta, I would have hoped that it would have happened faster, but hopefully there are things behind the scenes that are actually happening at, at that rate uh, that will become more apparent, especially when we get, you know, to version 11. Uh, again, thinks they'll achieve real world AI this year. Uh, Shanghai coming back with vengeance. So yeah, most likely vehicle production in Q2 will be on par with Q1. Um, so this, it wasn't clear if he meant total production, like worldwide production or just Shanghai. Uh, it doesn't really matter though too much because the, yeah, Fremont wasn't super constrained. So if he means Shanghai, then Fremont should do a similar output and then worldwide would therefore be a similar. If you only mean Shanghai, it's like the same, ends up being the same, same thing. So not particularly important, but uh, basically that means, you know, if Shanghai can do it, then the world can do it as well in terms of the production. Uh, it also sounded like some pretty decent updates from the supply chain in China. I think that's been one of the risks that we've had a lot of uncertainty on. And I think they clarified a lot around that. Uh, it sounds like they're not, not super worried about that beyond just the general challenges uh, that are happening uh, this year. A lot about pricing, 800 volt architecture. That was pretty interesting. I don't think we really need to recap any of that though. Um, in general, I think there were pretty pretty good questions on this call. Like definitely some eye rollers and I apologize for my reaction to some of those questions, uh, particularly the one about costs and prices to consumer. Like obviously robo taxis, Tesla's plans, Tesla's plan to address that. That's That's been clear for like a decade, so. Not quite that long, but at least five years. Uh, lithium, talked a lot about that. Not sure we need to go into too much detail on that. So faster ramps in Berlin and Austin. Now this is a little bit surprising because the build out for Berlin and Austin took quite a bit longer than Shanghai. I mean, you could call it about two times the, the amount of time. Um, hopefully that also means that once it is actually ready to start production, it's able to ramp up more quickly. That's what they're thinking. I'm not super convinced on that yet, just based on 4680s. Tesla's still not in volume production. They're hoping to get there in Q3, Q4, uh, which obviously that would be that would be great. That would be exciting. Um, and we'll have to model that out a little bit too, but I think, you know, my, my expectations are, are tampered a little bit just with that new technology and all the supply chain stuff. They didn't say it on this call, but, you know, the last couple of calls they've said that overall their production is constrained. So, you know, that's like the, in previous quarters, they could have produced more vehicles from Fremont and Shanghai. So if that's the case, and then you've got new factories like that, that doesn't really change. So that could be a factor to limiting the production ramps of these new factories as well. They did say that they've got plenty of 2170 packs though, which, so that's, that's definitely good because that was one of the things that was maybe a concern for Berlin for the next couple of quarters is okay with these shutdowns in China. Is that going to actually impact the availability of 2170 packs, which we know they're using from China in Berlin right now? Uh, but it doesn't sound like that's the case. So that's that's an exciting point. Uh, a little bit more on RoboTaxi. 
and then yeah the analyst questions which we already kind of talked about some of those things uh alex potter's question on the uh on the CEO compensation plan. So, um, yeah, it doesn't sound like Elon is planning to do another compensation plan. And in my model, I, I don't have one forecast. I think I, I would certainly be supportive of one, but I, I think Elon is content with his level of wealth from Tesla and his share count as it stands, uh, at this point. So, he, he's got strong incentive to continue to make Tesla work well and be financially successful uh, from those shares, which once the the shares are uh, vested, he needs to hold them for five years uh, from this most recent plan. So, you know, he, he's going to be sticking around for a while, just even without any, any other plan. Um, okay, supercharger network, it's going well. Tesla insurance. So, I mean, we started there, but yeah, super exciting with Tesla insurance. Like, it sounds like the take rate's high. Uh, the actual improvement in driver safety, that's the biggest cost of insurance. So the fewer accidents is going to make Tesla's margins or the cost on that same thing. Like we talked about, always driving in the same direction uh, of down. So it's, it's good on that. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm very excited about Tesla insurance and the fact that they're fully vertically integrated now doing the underwriting, uh, like partially explains to why they're keeping a lot of cash on, on hand. Um, if you grow insurance to a huge scale, like you're going to need, you need some cash for that. So, all right, I think that's it. Uh, let me, I don't know. I do appreciate these super chats. Um, I, I know I missed probably quite a few of them, but yeah uh exciting day exciting day so just kind of i guess a few last thoughts to recap probably the major highlights here i'll make myself a little bit bigger um yeah so I, i'm very excited about where tesla is at right now it's it's extremely clear that they're making a lot of strong progress in terms of the fundamental operation of their business with controlling their costs even during this period of difficult uh supply chain challenges logistics challenges Zach mentioned they're continuing to do expediting. Even with those uh, fees for expediting, we are still seeing an all-time high automotive gross margin, excluding regulatory credits of 30%. So a lot of strong fundamental progress. Uh, at the same time, that's all happening. Tesla is keeping their operating expenses under control. Uh, the operating margin of 19%, yes, that does include the regulatory credits. Uh, but even extracting that out, Tesla is by far now at this point the you know the most profitable highest profitability uh, automaker in the world and as they say in their earnings deck as they keep trying to hint at at the call on the calls more and more of their revenue is going to or more and more of their profitability is going to come from software and that's going to be high margin so there's definitely a roadmap for this to just continue to improve as tesla scales to extreme size um, the price to earnings ratio is already coming down significantly uh, just a quick note, if you were watching the, the video from earlier, I did have one, one mistake in there in the Q4. I know I had the Q3 stuff that was linked to something else. Q4, my gap and non-gap earnings per share numbers, those were slightly inflated because in my model, I had been playing around with it and I'd removed the $340 million payroll tax from Q4. So that was inflated by like 30 cents. So if you are using that number, the trailing 12 months gap earnings per share is now 737, not 766, like I had said. Anyway at the price which doesn't look like unfortunately it was refreshing here let me check on that i don't know why that stopped working um that's supposed to just automatically refresh but yeah it looks like tesla's only up four and a half percent right now which is a joke because it was down five percent on the day so the fact that you can buy tesla shares cheaper today than yesterday is pretty ridiculous given these results like it's just i mean <laughs> i shouldn't be surprised given like how stupid the market is has treated Tesla, is treating Tesla. It's just, it's so clear. I mean, look at Lars's response on <laughs> comparing the Cybertruck to the uh, to other pickup trucks. He's like, oh, I didn't even like think about that because it's just like so irrelevant, irrelevant to what Tesla is doing. Uh, it just shows how core to Tesla's thinking first principles is. Like they're not looking at any of that competition 
quote unquote competition because they just they just don't care. They know that their their path is better, uh, and they're just trying to make that path as good as possible. So, uh, that's just a an indicator of of what is to come. Uh, all right, I lost my train of thought a little bit. Just like major recap. So, yeah, I think like the the financial progress that Tesla is making is is excellent. Uh, the roadmap is extremely exciting, though slightly more uncertain now because of Tesla's more apparent shift into sort of like pushing all their chips in on robo taxi uh which we just we haven't seen come to fruition yet so could create some good opportunities uh you know if tesla gets into a period where they they haven't figured this out yet and growth is not quite happening because you know they went all in on this robo taxi and they're not gonna i mean maybe they would but the if, if they have this production plan for like a couple million, a few million robo taxis and they haven't solved FSD yet, like I don't know how they're gonna sell those. So that's where the big question for Wall Street comes in. Um, hopefully six, 12 months from now, 18 months, uh, we won't have to worry about that. Hopefully Elon's right in this case. It's not something I would bet on. So, well, I guess I kind of am bet on it, but <laughs> the reason, the reason that I'm bet on it is because I think Tesla's business, just even excluding those things, is so strong, like super clear roadmap to multi-trillion dollar valuation just from vehicles. And uh, if Tesla can figure out anything real world AI related, uh, just adds to that. So yeah, I guess just in summary, great financials, really strong fundamental progress. Robotaxi is super exciting, but also gonna present a little bit of conflict with Wall Street. All right, so that's where we're going to leave it then. Um, we'll, I'm sure we'll have a little bit more discussion on this uh, tomorrow, so make sure you are subscribed and sign up for notifications. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast. And yeah, we'll see you tomorrow for the Thursday, April 21st episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.